All right. I don't even know what episode this is because we're recording so many. I'm not <laughs> sure the order. Everything's going to be released, but welcome back, everybody. Um, we anticipate this is going to be a pretty good episode. In fact, it might be our retirement episode because I don't know if anyone will ever want to listen to Jackson and I again. <laughs> I know. After hearing this one. So, so uh, hopefully you stick with us. I know. I know. I hope so. Um, we'll introduce our guests here in just a minute. Um we're going to jump right into this, you guys, because there's going to be a lot of stuff to talk about. But uh, today, so we, we did some recording this morning, uh, then we had to run into town and uh, run some errands and whatnot. And as we were in town, um, there was a UPS man that was having a burger at Five Guys. And uh, so I said something to him in passing as we were walking by. Uh, you know, how's the how's the peak season going? How are you keeping up with stuff or whatever? Just kind of giving him a little, huh, hang in there, old buddy. I thought you... Wait, is that what you said? I think I so. thought you said something like, has anyone broken my UPS record? <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was doing it I was I was kinda giving him an underhanded pitch so that he'd ask me, What do you know about UPS? so that I could <laughs> tell him about what I used to do. Because I used to for UPS I was doing a round a night to Salt Lake and back to Billings. So I was, you know, doing the doing the big truck stuff, pulling the doubles. And, uh, of course, just waiting for my in. And sure enough, he's like, I told him about that. And then he's like, you know, that's what I've always wanted to do is to, to truck and become a feeder driver, they call them, the guys that just go back and forth for UPS with the semis. And I was like, well, what's, you know, what's the holdup? He's like, I got my permit. I got my stuff. But um, Billings is where I have to go to work, and no one in Billings will help me. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, no one will just, no one from UPS will help me. I was like, you need like a mentor or something down there? He's like, yeah, that, like exactly that. And I was like, oh, mentorship? Well, you better tune in to Steady at the Wheel because we've been talking about mentorship. But uh, let me tell you a real world little story of this real quick that just happened uh, two days ago. So a guy that listens to the podcast, um, in fact, it was old Roscoe that you met at the show, Roost. Um, remember Roscoe? Oh, yeah. Yep. yep, I do. So he calls me and he goes, hey, I got to tell you this story because it was – I owe this to the podcast, so just hear me out. And he goes, um, you know, he lives down in Billings, Montana, and he goes, I had these two young guys that are starting a construction company, or they've gotten to the point in their dirt construction company that they need a semi. So they're they're wanting to buy a semi. They'd already bought a side dump for moving dirt. And he goes, they call me, and they say, I want a semi, and what should we buy, and where do we go, and what do we do, and what should we look for, and on and on. And he goes, my first instinct was, uh, I, I don't want to deal with this. Because it's a lot when somebody literally knows nothing and you're trying to, to show them from, from the ground up what to do and, and what to look for. He goes, I was just about to just say, nah, sorry, guys. And then he goes, and then I remembered in the podcast, you guys were talking about mentorship and how part of the reason that the trucking culture is getting so is crashing today is because the lack of mentorship and so he's like this was my opportunity to mentor these these two guys so he goes i i told them what i would do and what i would buy what kind of engines to look for and stay away from and and uh you know they ended up buying a really cheap truck against his advice <laughs> and he goes that's fine but you can go ahead and expect to put about twenty five thousand dollars into that thing tomorrow to make it legit and sure enough, they they're twenty five thousand into fixing this old freight liner up. But um, he even told me he said uh, Saturday he goes they're going to come out Saturday. I'm going to teach him how to change a tire. And you know I told him the tire shops aren't always open. So now he's kind of like getting into it. Like this was his idea. Like hey guys, come out to my truck shop and I'll show you how to change a tire and I'll teach you the ways. So and he attributed it all to you know just listening in on the episodes over the last several weeks. So I thought that was pretty good. Yeah. You know, it's, it's what it's here for. So you guys, in the spirit of, uh, in the spirit of mentorship, we have brought two thundering, Thunder. thundering legends. <laughs> they roamed the roads of the West. They traveled high. They traveled low. They traveled inside. They traveled outside. They hauled it all from pigs to wallabies to hay to corn to 
each other from time to time. If I remember a few stories where one of you would drive while the other was shoveling the truck out on the highway. <laughs> they literally have done it all, you guys. These are these are two of the greatest greats that you're ever going to be able to uh, have the pleasure of listening to. We've got Billy Jack. If you remember, Rooster introduced him as <laughs> Billy Jack. <laughs> and do you know what he told us about why he called you Billy Jack? <laughs> He said it was because he found himself in a lot of jackknife situations. <laughs> I said in the early days. In the early days. <laughs> and he didn't say a lot. He said a, he said a, a couple or a few. A few jack jackknife situations. situations. <laughs> Which, as we know, with the ruthlessness of truckers, that probably was just one lone situation. <laughs> and it was like, that's it. For the rest of your days, it doesn't matter. You will be Billy Jack. So this is Bill Pearson, who uh, you guys, ironically, I... I spent all my all my young days working for Bill. So when I talk about you know the farm stories, the hauling hay and irrigating, all of that was for Bill, just a few miles uh, east of town here. And then we got uh, a familiar face back on with us again, old man Rooster, as we affectionately call him. And uh, this is good. The reason that we brought them both in, well, there's a couple reasons. Uh, one would be that they're full of. Well, there's, they have so many stories, you guys, that you're going to get to listen to, you're going to love. But you guys, is it fair to say that Rooster, you kind of mentored Bill? Was that? Definitely. Yeah. I was a grain trucker because the farm was so poor that I would truck grain down to Lewiston, Idaho in the winter and, and uh, not much money in it, uh, coming home empty. And Russ... And his dad uh, talked me into trucking cows because I like cows, and but I didn't know how to get started in it. And so Russ uh, definitely was my bread and butter to teach me and show me the ins and outs of getting into the cattle trucking business. And I remember uh, the first truck I had was a 318 Detroit <laughs> four, <laughs> 4 on the 4. <laughs> and he's constantly shifting it and russ we would load up <clears throat> my very first trip russ's trips always had a lot of little stops you know hooderite colonies auction barns uh horse trailers alongside the road <laughs> yep. and so when we finally got trucking and, and made it to alzada i was exhausted and i asked russ I said, uh, were you almost at Sioux Falls? Because I had never been. You know, and this <laughs> is before, been. there's no phones, yeah, no, no I mean, phone. the maps is no very, cell phones like that very primitive. <laughs> and Russ looks at me and he goes, Willie, he says, if you can't drive for 24 hours, he says, you will never be a cattle trucker. <laughs> you pansy, you wimp, and call me a few names to help regenerate me. To, it's like, we're not anywhere close to Sioux Falls. And we, we made it, but the, <laughs> the sad part was is I didn't even know to bring a spare clothes, a change of clothes. You're just doing the deal. Yeah. He was a rookie. <laughs> yeah. And so Russ lent me some clothes after we showered up so I could change out of the hog smell and make her back home. And, and uh, I always loved Russ's. Uh, it was mandatory to make a card and put the axles of your truck in the different compartments oh, yep. and then arrows of how you're going to load it for weight and everything because only the stupid livestock truckers do it twice. And so we would load everything in every compartment. And I kept that as a rule my entire trucking career. That's good. That's smart. <coughs> so a couple of things I want to back up on real quick that pop into mind. Uh, one was you were trucking to Lewiston, Idaho, out of this area in the winter time. Yeah, this was your gig of. Yep. That's what was available at the time. Yep. Now, if you guys don't know, the road to Lewiston, Idaho, is not particularly friendly in the summertime, let alone in the winter time. And your route, I'm guessing, was up over Rogers Pass. Yep. To Missoula. Yep. And then was that Highway 12 that winds? 212. Okay. Or not 212. It. Uh up over Lolo, yeah, I think, down the Lockshaw River. You do that with yeah. with this old 318. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you guys, let me. So for those of you that don't know, this is just so good <laughs> because if you don't know what a 318 Detroit is, you you need to just Google it and, and look it up. But it's probably the equivalent of hooking up like a 20 foot 
bumper pull horse trailer to a Ford Escort. <laughs> <laughs> And then hitting the road, right? I mean, oh, I'm not yeah. wrong. No. <laughs> Lots of noise, very little power. Just, you, you can't even, <laughs> in these old trucks, too, these old, they, you just, all you hear is just the scream. Because all, you just yeah. floor it all the time, right? Yeah. And, and this is the same truck that you turned into a seed tender in its older years, right? Yeah. Because I remember getting in that as a teenager to move it around for you. And you never told me, like, twin sticks and all this. And it was just kind of like, mm-hmm. Mm, and all of a sudden we're going backwards i'm like oh nope 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 <laughs> yeah uh you know and, and doing the deal but i had no idea growing up that that tender truck that we hauled seed with made the track to sioux falls oh yeah no it was <laughs> but eventually of course we upgraded and got into the cab overs and the freight liners and and uh, got a little more power got better trailers the first trailer i had stock trailer was one that got wrecked up by Browning that dad and I rebuilt an old steel one and uh, not big enough floors were slick and, uh -huh. and so we let me just tell you about that trailer <laughs> it sat up Browning off the side of the road for many years and I believe you got it for a thousand dollars yeah it was cheap <laughs> <laughs> I remember there was no roof on it so we put a kind of unpeeled a chunk of tin over the top of it and and I remember one of the first loads with it, we were hauling bread cows to Nebraska. And uh, most of the cows were down, not laying down and resting because the floors <laughs> were like glass. And I remember stopping to that gravel pit, yeah. just throwing in shovel full after shovel full <laughs> of gravel. For trash. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we finally got them where they were back on their feet. But that's one I think he decided it's definitely time to upgrade a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, this is what I love about everyone always talks about old school trucking like yeah chrome and chicken lights and i'm like no no old school trucking in my neck of the woods was yeah. bill driving thousand dollar steel trailers with a 318 detroit <laughs> with gravel on it for traction <laughs> with gravel. that's old school trucking like, like hand shoveling that, gravel into that it that might have been why russ was the only one that would load me <laughs> <laughs> like hmm. see the other funny thing is is from my perspective I never, because we were, you know, old blue, the old yep. dad's old Freightliner. I didn't realize there was a time where old blue looked pretty oh, shiny yeah. to you versus you the old International you were driving. Yeah. My my recollections were always like, everyone's blowing our doors off. Bill's gonna go to Rapid City and wait there for us till we catch up because by then you were driving old black, and uh, old blue was always yeah. kind of you know last. Well, she was classy, and at that time because of the weight limits then old blue could haul quite the load back in those days huh. and so it had dual spotlights and i went to browning a few times with russ and and i remember thinking man this is a pretty nice truck it's pretty sweet <laughs> and then of course when uh, the next truck was it that you put the up sleeper on that was old blue was that old blue yeah yeah when he did that then i was like oh wow some serious <laughs> yeah they cut a hole in the roof over the passenger seat and there was a little cab on top with a bed up there and so we had a pretty cool yeah uh okay so so then you uh once you've seen isn't it every young farmer's dream to kind of be a cowboy is that well i had some cows but i i didn't consider myself a cowboy at that time you know because i had farming was in my blood more and but my you, dad hated cows but you were always cowboy oh, yeah. you had a horse and you oh, always yeah. had calves around you always yeah. leaned and that that was boots. really only because of the allens because i had a few cows and i never could afford uh, my own bull and don would let me come into the feedlot and he'd have a big old pan of bulls and i remember the one time red angus bulls were in there he says i don't care just whatever one you want so i opened the gate and one came out immediately chased around gonna load it up turned back on me chased me up the thing so i went and told don in the jailer house and he said no do whatever and so he came out and he went to chase it up and it turned back on him and don with his belly <laughs> I remember clean, climbing up the sides, <laughs> but it it uh, Don 
would buy uh, cattle for me when I was just a kid, baby calves. Oh, really? And Dom's mind was incredibly sharp back then because, of course, calculators and stuff were hardly even known. Uh He could just do math sitting right there as the cattle came through, and that always impressed me. And for everyone listening, Don (coughs) is Jackson and Maiden's grandfather, Roost's dad. Yep. So that's that's when he says Don, that's who he's talking about is our grandfather. Yeah. And then Russ always had the buy lots of cattle and hogs and sheep and uh, whatever it took to make the loads. And I would go to Sioux Falls quite a bit, following Russ buddy out there. See, in, in my days, it, it seemed like it was a little more rare that you get the double hog loads. You know, it was maybe twice a summer, three times a oh. summer. And it was probably in part because... You were farming a lot by then, too, in the summer, and it wasn't great, but I just lived for the double runs <laughs> because because I could get out of the... Uh, about to fall. Oh, yeah, right there. Uh, I lived for the double runs because it was my chance to get to ride in a long nose truck. I remember <laughs> yeah. just sitting in that seat and staring out the window being like, wow, wow, <laughs> you know? And, of course, we couldn't even get Dad to... He was ste- white steel wheels just just the bear which is very good you know very thrifty yeah. but you always had old black by yeah. then I, you know you'd come through the ranks yeah. apparently from the old international and you had a little cab over for a little while yeah i had a white uh cab over a freight liner and uh had a 350 cummings okay. in it and i think it was a small cam cummings it wasn't quite you know up to but i when i had 13 speed so it was you could hit like 60 miles an hour (laughs) once in a while that's right that's right (laughs) so i i like that truck i enjoyed it but once you started moving up to the kitty cats then life we didn't weren't so fuel conscious (laughs) fuel conscious holton's always told me hey this mileage i got out of my detroit and (laughs) saved myself so much money and and all the rest of it is like what are you talking about nice son would you guys ever in a thousand years back in the 80s when you were trucking if we said that your sons would be paying six dollars a gallon for diesel would you have ever imagined (laughs) no (laughs) in a million years yeah yeah no rest buddy in fact the names when you talk about names the uh the names that i remember was uh because we work so much with the heterites russ especially then my name was wee willie whiff and Russ's <laughs> name was Paul Flying Saucer. <laughs> was the name. These were your road and, names. And so the uh, one evening, my dad did a lot of trekking with us, and sometimes he'd go with me, and other times Russ would have three loads that he'd take out to Sioux Falls. And Russ and I were coming back, and we didn't have cell phones. It was just CB. Uh-huh. And so we were chit-chatting, and we somehow morphed ourselves into heterites, <laughs> that had escaped the colony that we were trucking these hogs you know and some other uh truckers got on the cb that weren't real happy and pleased with us and they really thought we were you know because we were looking talking about the black pants how it chafed us a little and we wanted 501 wranglers we were looking for <laughs> only 501 which was a levi thing yeah right? which was a levi <laughs> you're calling them wranglers yeah and so uh, somebody got on the CB and wondered how we ended up getting kicked out of the colony. And I don't remember the story I made up because I enjoyed Russ's so much. <laughs> Is he was used to be the, uh, the egg man, <clears throat> chicken man, and well, you know they have that dark room, and you gotta candle those eggs and check them for blood spots and stuff. And, well, he got to, instead of candle, and he got to fondling. <laughs> and then he got kicked out of the so car. gave him the boots. Oh, yeah. And then he yeah, had stand in church, and we had this whole line of bull roar. <laughs> and they were just buying it. And then people would come on, and they said, We know where you can get some 501 Wranglers and the rest of it. <laughs> and my, that's one of the few times my dad in the sleeper was just busting a gut because it took a lot to make George laugh. You got laugh. Papa George laughing. Yeah, we had we him coming. rolling how <laughs> stupid we were. And Bill, I remember one night we were doing the accent again, pretending that we were German <laughs> truckers on some kind of, uh, what do you do, exchange? exchange. Yeah. Like a work exchange. work exchange, and we're talking about our little frolins back in Germany, and we were saying, 
how back there those we said Levi's 105s you could get like 200 bucks for a pair of those so we're going on and on with their accents and and saying about the Audubons we could haul triples at 140 miles an hour and what a <laughs> bunch of wusses out here in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. yeah we we had to do what we did to pass the to time stay away to yeah. oh man so the people listening you're understanding this is on the cb radios they're each in separate trucks talking on the cb radios which anyone with a cb radio in range of them can hear these conversations yeah it's just open for anyone yep so that's part of the fun of it is because you, you can suck people in you're almost put you're putting on a show for other people so that they hear it and you just you're just messing with people yeah and uh and then when my dad would go with Russ and I, Russ and I'd always like to talk a little more, frankly, just to each other without my dad, you know, judging. What we might <laughs> yeah, be it's tough. Having your dad, having, so, working with your dad all the time, so, worrying about what you. Yeah, you know how so, that is. Yeah. <laughs> so when dad would follow us, Russ and I's trigger word was anything about the weather. Oh, it looks like it's starting to cloud up. And then we'd switch the channels down to where we had already <laughs> pre planned to talk. We talked for a while, and they're like, "Oh, we better get back up and talk to George." <laughs> so we come up and talk to him for a while, and then we go back down. <laughs> that was always kind of entertaining. <laughs> oh, that's good. We had a we had a code word. Uh, we always went with county. We'd be talking anytime anyone um, brought up the, the you know county, anything county. Like, what, what county are you from? What, what county are we trucking to? county meant we'd go to the number you know teton county would be 31 of course there's not a 31 but in lewistown we're eight so we'd go to channel eight and that would be our, that'd be our That's thing we're out. yep <clears throat> yep and of course with the mentoring uh just a little farm boy trying to learn the whole new world of trucking and stuff and i had some uh you know teaching me that it's okay to shower after you dump the cows <laughs> off and stuff. you might want to bring some clothes that, he still hasn't got that one into me i still find myself <laughs> two or three loads deep without a shower but the the one that to this very day sticks to my mind is uh back in those days aids was coming around and it looked pretty serious you know and didn't know how you get it or whatever that was russ and i were both up to the urinal at the truck stop or whatever <laughs> Russ goes, uh, Willie, he says, you got to put a little flick to that thing once in a while or the AIDS can crawl back up the urinal. <laughs> Come out of the urinal. <laughs> so, so to this very day, it's like, oh, well, you know, I don't know, safety first, whatever. <laughs> so, there's, there's a few of those precious moments that Russ taught me. And then the other the other one that I, I remember is, is – uh, I'll I'll tell this one. Now, there's so many good stories that I won't share. But the, <laughs> yeah, the uh, when Russ, uh, we always had this badgering about: is the handicap stall used more than the regular stalls? Because mm -hmm. both Russ and our big boys handicap stalls so are much more comfortable than <laughs> the rest of it. But is it cleaner? You know, or used less and. I was in there, uh, got to the handicap stall first and and uh, doing my business. And I heard somebody come in, didn't think of much of it, you know, and a little rustle at my door. And, and I was like, I take him. <laughs> and all of a sudden, boom, the door just flies open and this bare butt's back and a beep, beep, beep. <laughs> I was like, hey, hey. <laughs> and of course, it was rest, but he put in the fear of the Lord in me. <laughs> Oh, that was a pressure tonight. <laughs> it, uh, Russ was about as close to an older. I don't have an older brother, but Russ was as close to an older brother as I could get. I, so I love think, that. Things to look for in a mentor are the ability to kick down the door to the stall and back it up. Uh, I, I'm trying to add these up, but teach you how to do the flick in the public <laughs> urinals. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, yeah, those things stick with you for life. Bill needed a, needed a lot of tutoring. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh. And then, of course, I, for me, the uh, I was a, a divorced man for a good part of my 10 years. I was not married, and I had a couple kids. And, and uh, I, I remember this one time, it's really stuck with me, because at Mitchell, there's this 
uh, old theater, and they had a lion stuffed in it or something. What was that in the corner, Russ? Yeah, stuffed lion. It used to be a live lion back in the 30s or 40s. Yeah. and uh, Metro Goldwyn Meyer, whatever, had that oh, big lion okay. roars. <clears throat> and I, I remember like, I kind of having a tough time with where I was at in my life, you know, and, and uh, if it worked out in the schedule, once in a while, Russ and I would catch a movie at that theater. Like every trip. <laughs> 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 yeah. And uh, that movie I was playing was Mrs. Doubtfire. And it was about, at the end of it, it talked about how different families and love and, and, you know, bringing it together. And, of course, at that time of my life, I I was uh, very in tune to all that uh, different stuff that I felt inside when the lights came on. There were a couple tears, you know, big old tears coming out, and I look over at Russ, and there was a tear at Russ's eye, too. And I was like, doggone it. I go, he's your... Sure, good guy to be hooked up to, and and Russ, uh, even in my personal life, uh, had a lot of good advice for me through the years, and and also financially. The probably one of the best things I learned was never to quit working at it. I mean, we had some nasty truck trips with decking falling through and hogs on top of sheep and uh, breakdowns and storms and driving 55 miles an hour all the way to kansas or oklahoma <laughs> whatever that trip we kept in those, doing just never ending oh, just on just and on la la land <laughs> mentally we get out do some jumping jacks and then go to drooling right back <laughs> <out of> there. <laughs> but we made it because russ would there was no quit it, it was just keep on moving along and it'll get over just so. keep her going that's a good that's good that's good i think uh I can I could say Dad pushed that same same thing on us from you know you it was never you never walked did you ever walk anywhere with Rooster when he had told you to go get something or do something if you walked oh, no. you didn't make it three steps walking and what was he doing hustle hustle <laughs> hustle go 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 but one one word of advice for you married people saying hustle to your wife does not work <laughs> <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> It's kind of like trying to start your pickup by honking the horn. <laughs> <laughs> so never tell your wife to hustle. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh man, this is good. This is good. I've been I've been waiting for a long time. Anytime I get a chance. Uh, so when I was a single man, uh, rest at uh, where was the cafe? Was it at Mitchell that we'd stop and eat with the, your friends? Your the buyers? Star Wars, the Star Wars cafe. Yeah. Star Wars Cafe, because yeah. there's lots of variety. Of yeah, people. that's the one. So, uh, Russ says, Willie, I got a special treat for you tonight. Waiting at Star Wars Cafe. I was like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's <laughs> usually no, no <laughs> good treats. Special there. treat. And he goes, Yeah, I got to this little Indian gal that, that's uh, waiting for you, and two of you could meet or whatever. And so, we pulled in there and went into the restaurant. She was a waitress there. And, I mean, you know, they had to work at it to find a woman the same size I was. But they (laughs) had been able to to do it. As soon as I sat down, she sat on the outside of the the, uh, uh, table and squished me in against the wall. So you're locked in. In in a booth. Just started (laughs) petting my shoulders and hair and and the rest of it. And and, uh, I was a little embarrassed. And, of course, Russ and his friends were just having a time with their lives. Go, Willie! You know, and, and uh, when we're done, I tell Russ, I said, I don't know, you know, I don't know if that's going to work because it looks like she kind of fell out of the ugly tree and hit every branch all the way down. But then Russ goes, oh, Willie, but her dad has like 10 sections of ground out there. And I tell Russ, I said, well, if I married her, I'd have to have ASCS maps above the headboard with a flashlight at night <laughs> to see why I was still with that thing. But that, I came to a quick halt after that, but it was nice of them to try. <laughs> yes, this was old school trucking. It's so old school trucking. Don't get upset. It's old school trucking. Yep. One piece of advice I did give Willie when his oldest son, Holton, was in the incubator. Uh, he was using the same doctor that we use for, for I guess, for Stoney. He was asking about this doctor, and I said, "Oh, he's a really nice guy. I like him, except one thing that drives me nuts." 
said no conjugal relations from the third month until three months after birth. And I said, man, I, everything I read, that's just not right. But that's what he insists on. <laughs> Poor Bill, you know, a young strap and newlywed. He was just freaking. <laughs> on that same line, when, when I do remember, there's two jokes I remember from, because there's always a good joke at the feedlot wrestling catch. And when I got married, he said something that I might want to tell my bride that for the uh, birth control method we're going to use is, is uh, I'd be on a little five-gallon bucket, and when my eyes got as big as silver dollars, just kick the bucket out from underneath me or something like that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that would do it. Yeah. Maybe that that's why. Maybe that's why I got divorced. I don't know. <laughs> Could be. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Oh, I'm gonna catch my breath. Oh, I I really don't laugh as hard as I do when you guys get going. <laughs> Um. Uh, so, uh, just on a on a little bit of a serious note, because this is uh, you know, provide some some good stories, but some serious stuff. Um, you mentioned earlier that you started trucking to subsidize the farm. Yep. Right. Um, was that back in the eighties when the interest was all whacked? Yep. Yeah, eighteen percent interest. <laughs> it got that high. Yeah, and then Jimmy Carter, uh, back in his presidency. He put an embargo on Russia because at those days Russia actually needed wheat. Instead, now they're the world's biggest wheat producer. Okay. And so the price of wheat and grain stayed the same for almost a decade. And high interest, very difficult. A lot of farmers uh, went into bankruptcy and sold their farms and came to town to work. And so we were trying to figure out how to generate income that would synergize with our farm and the truck, of course, we could use it on the farm and then hop in and go make some money in the fall. See, I've always thought I've always thought this is what led to some of the golden years of trucking was, you know, everyone's like, man, trucking in the 80s. It's because all these real, you know, people, I think, across the country left farms and ranches trying to trying to subsidize their, you know, by the sweat of their brow, make things work. So that's kind of an interesting insight. And of course, my all-time favorite trucking story with Russ that a lot of people don't even, uh, they have a hard time believing, <laughs> is the trip that we did to Arizona. We had loaded up two loads of calves, taking out of Montana, and it was wintry up here. And as we got down to Utah, my truck, the old cab over Freightliner, uh, died the motor seized up or oh, something. Like, like serious. <clears throat> died. Serious died. And so someone else had to hook on to my trailer. At that point, I hopped in with Russ and Wendy, was going down to see your folks. Russ and, and Wendy and six kids. Yeah. Did you have the, you had the crew? Had the crew so they could see the grandparents. Okay. You guys, dad's cab <clears throat> over had, I would say, probably a 48 inch sleeper, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah, I bet it was a 48-inch sleeper. So, <laughs> spring ride cab over 1980, 48-inch um, sleeper, and the upstairs. We had the upstairs, right? Yeah. yeah. I think. So, dad, mom, and several of us. I don't know how many, we think it was all the kids. Pretty close to yeah, somewhere between four and six of the uh, <laughs> of the children, and then with with Bill breaking down, there was no other option other than to climb aboard. Yeah. And so we're getting. Let me give you a little background. Uh, when I we loaded, I hadn't been to Arizona before, so I called my neighbor because I see I can carry more than most people with my setup. So I called my neighbor. Was that said, was that with or without Bill on board? <laughs> <laughs> I was skinnier back then. Oh, all, hey. I can, <laughs> all I can say when he was in there and we crossed the scale, the guy came on the CB and said, "Could you move your driver's seat back two clicks?" <laughs> So that trip. <laughs> but no, let me give a little bit more. So I called Oakley Brothers and said, I don't know what the re regulations are. Know. Can I go 86 in Arizona like I can? Utah, Idaho, and Montana. He goes, oh, let me think. Yeah, you can. <laughs> so I maxed her out. I went <laughs> oh, over no. about 87. I knew I'd be shrunk down pretty good. So that's that's where we're at. So you're heavy. Heavy. You guys, Arizona's an 80,000 pound mm -hmm. only. So he's, he's you know, at that point, you're probably 4,000, 5,000 pounds overweight still. And so to figure out how to cross the scale, Russ had this. But first, let me give you a little okay. more background. We, cro <laughs> we crossed there at Canab, that port of entry there. 
we go in and that guy says, yeah, you're fine here, but you'll never get across the scale of page. There is no way. And I'm just freaking, because if anyone's been through page, there's no corrals, no fences. It's just wide open desert as far as the eye can see. So I'm in quite a pickle. You know, <laughs> me and Holton don't worry about that stuff anymore. I know you get, but <laughs> I'd like to see you blow page. I'd like to see you guys blow page. <laughs> That's impossible. The me pass that you're on with these <laughs> the days is pass. quite legendary. <laughs> anyway. So anyway, I... I'm thinking, man, we've got to get down there. And so Bill was in with us, and that Utah people hooked onto the truck. I told him, I said, we're going to stop. And uh, I said, there's a lot of room on the top of my trailer for the cattle to move around. I think if I put Billy up there, and you know those scales are only 8 or 10 foot scales, so you weigh one axle at a time. So I said, I can put Billy up there. He can push all the cattle to the back. When you say up there, you mean inside the trailer with the cattle? Oh, yeah, inside. has to be the only way. And plus, I'm used to hauling the hogs. So we had it boards on the side. So we took all the boards off the off side and put them all on the scale side so he could not see anything. So it's all the holes are blocked. We did so much preparation. <laughs> and those Utah truckers said, you guys are in tr- we're going to go. You're going to have to wait. So they took off. And oh, no. sure. yeah, yeah, they went across with this. So we get out there in the desert. Well, hold on. The boards for the truck in the winter time with these <clears throat> these uh, bull racks hauling hogs, you attach boards to the side of the truck to lessen the amount of air that can blow in on those hogs. Yeah, they die like flies. And if you it's don't cold. you don't completely enclose it. You leave you still leave some air. So what Roost is talking about on one side of the truck they took all the boards off and put it on. The side of the truck that the people on the scale would be looking at so you could not see into the truck the back of the truck they couldn't see the montana flash up there in the back (laughs) so we got billy up on top out of where we're doing preparation and wendy was saying we're going to jail this is not happy Uh -uh. (laughs) so i hot shotted billy up onto that top deck (laughs) then i had him get all the cattle pushed to the back and then we timed how long it would take him to crawl underneath and swim through them, get to the other end, then push them all up to the front of the truck after I had the front axle weighed and off the scale. And and I told, I said, when I pull off the scale, I'll kill the engine. Oh, like jump the clutch and kill yeah, it? Yeah. And, and I had Wendy. I said, as soon as we got the scale, I had her get off, get every ounce out of there and all the kids too so i said put on some lipstick and wendy is hot and back then she's really hot <laughs> so i said go in there and, and uh, conversate that scale guy so he's not paying attention to what we're doing so we had it all timed out so billy's riding up top for the last couple of miles <laughs> until we get to the scale so then when russ hit the the uh clutch pop or shut the key off whatever would jerk it and i pushed all the calves up to the front and we pass the scale easily for our weight i still remember the the numbers we were 84 2 at canab okay and we were 79 4 <laughs> at page so he moved beautiful. five thousand pounds of calves <laughs> but then the problem was there's no place to pull over to let me out really quickly and as I'm riding back there, I'm like, has Russ forgot about it? <laughs> I could, so I worked my hand through some of that wind horizon plywood, and I was kind of waving it off to the side. There's like, it's not fun anymore. <laughs> you know, these calves are getting real friendly. And it was kind of cool because at first the calves were afraid of you or, you know, aggressive or whatever. And then we just became one. <laughs> you know, <they're, laughs> I felt like I was part of the livestock. And so then Russ finally found a place to get pulled over and so i got off just covered in calf crap yeah because it's juicy in oh, there. oh yeah. yeah and remember bill's uh clothing situation yeah oh yeah he was still still learning learn still learning. i had forgot my clothes in the truck that broke down <laughs> oh so you had learned by now yes. to bring them you just... no no i had yeah i had my duffel bag but not with me <laughs> it was in the truck that was broke down in utah <laughs> And so I don't know how it came up, but I think Wendy had a pair of yellow sweatpants. Actually, they were they were mine. They were blue ones. They're small on me, so and I didn't so, wear much. So I wedged those things on with my cowboy boots, and I had my shirt or whatever. 
and hard to keep them on the on the moon part. <laughs> it got real breezy, and so when we get down to Arizona, traffic comes to a complete stop. This and, is like down in Phoenix. And, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we lost so much time. Originally, we planned to go through there and miss rush hour. And there's right. one calf that would keep going down, getting mm. tired, and so Russ goes, Willie. Says, take this hot shot and jump out there and see if that calf is down while traffic's stopped. So I jump out there with my sweatpants and boots, and sure enough, that calf's down. So I gave it a few shots and got it, was it on up. the top deck. So Bill was so up, you gotta climb up, climb up the side of the truck. Just then, traffic starts to move. Russ, does he wait for me to quickly run it? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> And so I'm clinging on with my hot shot and my thing there to the side of the truck as traffic goes by. And cars would go by, and then you'd see them kind of break and come back and look at me or whatever. <laughs> and the sweatpants kept moving down. I could feel it in the wind, but I wasn't going to let go because I'd die. I had to hang on, you know. And that, so that was a precious moment. You guys, in my defense, that traffic, we'd stop and go. We'd go like... 50 feet and have to stop again so when it started to move i thought 50 feet and we stop again For some reason it cleared we're up like to 15 20 <laughs> it was 25. Like the, the last plug of traffic <laughs> and people by us they're talking about but they had their window down telling wendy through her window <laughs> <laughs> there's a man on your truck yeah. and i said call the cops <laughs> <laughs> but on that same trip to show how tough he had to be back in those days we got out to the desert where we were going to unload the calves and the truck that was pulling my trailer didn't make the approach and tipped it a little bit and so we had to unhook from the pup trailer and back Russ's truck up because he had the side door mm. and it it didn't match up perfectly and we had to tail the calves and hold them up enough to get them into Russ's truck and then go and load it until that trailer was empty. Oh, and after all that. After yeah. all that. And then your dad ended up getting ringworm <laughs> because of working the calves. I remember a few weeks later, it's like, what's that on there? I thought we were flicking it. What was that? And it's like ringworm growing up his arm. Oh, yeah. That was a trip. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, man. Oh. I couldn't believe those Wussy Utah truckers want at least a half hour jump on us. They want to be way past the scale. Yeah, I don't want, I, we don't want no part of this. But if you guys know that road past Page back in those days, in the old times, that thing was a narrow two lane. There's no place to stop. Yeah. I felt bad <laughs> knowing Bill was. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I can tell how bad he felt. I couldn't yeah. stop. Kind of a little junction down there. I found a spot I could get off. I finally a pulled over at Flagstaff and was like, <laughs> find yeah. my truck stop, Bill. <laughs> and I sacrificed my sweats for him to get out of yeah. those manure pants. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, your dad was always, it was, it was you know, fun to see what you're going to haul, but it was always fun to see what he had thrown in extra on the trip, which, you know, like meeting that Indian girl. And then also, I did not realize we had a singing career happening. Oh. And your dad at Broadus, we'd always stop and eat at Broadus at the cafe there. And your dad says, well, they're expecting us to uh, put on a little show there tonight. When we get there, we're going to sing for our supper. See, one, one <clears> night <throat> a month, they'd have open mic kind of, and all these people come out of the hills. Uh -huh. I mean, they're rough looking. Remember that lady with this long coat and... And rubber boots up to her knees and i mean it's a lot of just some interesting yeah kind of sheep country folk oh yeah and mm -hmm. also the owner of the cafe the husband that's when i remember oh. <laughs> <laughs> he was had uh, stage four cancer in his brain but he's still helping you know serving he had a big patch over one eye and he always had his lip was so full of snooze i mean it's just so and he was gross he was bringing your food out right plus though when he'd stand sideways the t brain tumor was pushing his one eyeball out so when he turned sideways you could see on the side <laughs> that the eye was about this far pushed out by that brain tumor <laughs> made eating a little tough there didn't it willie yes it did and when we uh so when we pulled in that evening we i think russ and i both were on the atkins diet in fact, it wasn't a Kenzie that did the test. Panda. Panda, yeah. For her, you know, but anyway, we were hard at it because we had some pressure from... Science project for Panda. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. 
and uh, so we ate our Salisbury steak with green beans was about what it was and so then afterwards they get up and introduce we're going to have some music special music uh, brought to you tonight and Russ grabbed a guitar, and I never was sure if he really played guitar or not. <laughs> you know, he kind of strummed out a little something, and sang some type of country western song or whatever. And then uh, I had my little cassette tape with some karaoke music, and they had some player thing they had found, and I put that in, and sang a couple songs, and I remember how entertained. Oh, but they, they loved they were it. They like, were probably amazed. They were like free dessert for those. I <laughs> You guys, can't on the Atkins. Atkins. You yeah. guys don't know though. Bill has an unbelievable singing voice. <laughs> That's true. So these people were very well entertained. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. That and also, uh, they actually named that meal the Russ Special for years. That's what it was called in there. <laughs> the Salisbury steak. Huh? It was just a big hamburger steak with scrambled eggs and a can of green beans with bacon in it. <laughs> you were the steak, and Bill was the green bean side. <laughs> <laughs> And so another trip that we did, I had never been to Deadwood, and oh, always geez. wanted to go. <laughs> now this is a, you know this is honest open mic, right? Cannot yeah, be held against us. No, we're getting this out for posterity. <laughs> so, so uh, it happened to be one of those triple trips where my dad was with me, and so Russ and I decided we'd go together in Russ's truck let dad start heading home well you remember willie he had a wheel bearing go out on the front wheel and we thought it'd be the next day before it got fixed yep didn't happen oh so you think you had a free night a night night off all kinds of time yeah Mm. and so we headed up to deadwood and and uh kind of windy very snowy it was in the winter time and for those that don't know what's what's deadwood south dakota yep what is it it's a now that's a gambling capital of the area. Yeah, it's kind of just like it's like a little getaway town. We've never been there. We just heard about it. Yeah, yeah it was, and so we're pulling into town, and it's dark. You know, just the street lights, and and there's a historic Deadwood Park. And yeah, it has a. Remember the it forked. It said historic Main Street, and then the other Main Street. Yeah, we had to make a quick decision. And because the rest is truck, it can go anywhere a pickup right. can because right. it's pulling the pup trailer. It turns good. We're like, ah, let's take this so we can catch a little shot of it. And as we're coming down that street, we look ahead of us, and here's this "Welcome to Deadwood" sign, the banner all the way across the street hanging down. And as we're getting closer, we're like, I don't think we're gonna fit underneath that. <laughs> It's sure enough, we did it. It looked like something out of Dumb and Dumber that strapped around the front of the cab over. We rolled our windows down trying to reach it and grab it to pull it off, hoping no one else would see us dragging that sign around town. Do you remember that the last scene in Jurassic Park when the, the Jurassic Park banner kind of comes down and that the T-Rex is just roaring in rage? That's kind of what I imagine, old blue. You guys, there was so much snow that there was zero at Rapid City, at least two feet up at Deadwood, and the berm on that historic Main Street was like five, six feet tall, and the cars parked parallel on the side. I was scared to death, snaking through there. At, so I was scraping snow on my side, and Billy was <laughs> saying, oh, man, we're getting close. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've never been so glad to get out of there, even I, though we had that stupid banner across our windshield. I wish I would have folded it up and caught, uh, kept it to this <laughs> very day. It would have just been so awesome. <laughs> yeah. And so we, had, uh, <laughs> we got done uh, at Deadwood and headed home and called Papa George, my dad, and uh, he had got ahead of us. And we're like, ooh, <laughs> this is going to be hard to explain. <laughs> and finally, he got tired at Harlow Town and went to bed. And Russ and I passed him in the night and made it to town <laughs> before he did because we were like, uh oh. He's like pulling the greatest all nighter of his life. And yeah. Like, George, you got to go to yeah. bed. Please what go to bed world? somewhere. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. he was supposed to spend the night there in South Dakota, <laughs> and they got that stupid bearing fix for him that night instead of the next morning. Yeah, uh, we knew that Bill was toast if he didn't beat oh, George. Yeah. Home. yeah. Uh. Then another nice little winter trekking experience was Lyle, uh, Russ's brother, had some cattle or something bought over at Kalispell, and we decided that we'd head out there, Russ and I, and. Lyle was riding with Russ and I, taking turns back and forth in the different trucks. 
and it was a bad blizzard type of snow blowing. Now, I, and I can't wait to hear this because we, we recently kind of, oh, it's been weeks ago, but we looked over this story a little bit. And I'm curious to know your perspective on this because dad was very much, you know, Bill squeak, squeals, <laughs> you know, his terrors in the night stuff. So I can't wait to hear your your perspective being, well, he's my mentor and yeah. we've been through Deadwood together, we, we, you know, whatever, we'll, uh, yeah. we, will, we will go. And so we past uh Depulier. i think there was a road close sign yeah, definitely i was in front you guys kept saying go <laughs> yeah, go go and we swerved around and i was following us and of course with russ and lyle i'm not asking quite should we stop okay. yeah. to turn back right. i wasn't gonna see any of the pins it was like babe let's go because <laughs> russ is busting the <laughs> drips going, yeah it's easy if he can make it i can make it <laughs> and so we uh are climbing i don't know how many miles out of Browning, we spun out on that. What? I don't know. It might have been the same hill that I ended up buying my original trailer from. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been. It's like the ghost. Of- <laughs> yep. Yeah. Here you come. And uh, <laughs> so Russ and I, uh, he spun out on the bottom of the hill, and I had some momentum left, and so I swung around Russ and and went up the hill a little further. Of course, didn't make it. Spun out. And it was so windy and pure ice that I would cram that brake down a cab over back that day, down to the fender of the truck. And every time I let up a little bit, it would relax one set of brakes. And I don't know if it's the steering brakes that relax or, you know, because you have your trailer and your truck. And anyway, I would start sliding down, heading for my next jackknife off of that hill. Because I I did jackknife my truck uh, when I hauled grain once on the lock shop. So that that was where... (laughs) So that was the Billy Jack. Jack. And anyway, (laughs) very uh, scared to death. And so uh, Lyle tried to come up. We knew we weren't going to be able to do anything that night. We're going to have to hunker down until morning and then assess what we could do. And so Lyle crawled up alongside of the shoulder of the road, took my chains and tried to wedge them underneath the tires, my drivers, enough that it would hold me there. It was so windy and slick with ice that the chains would just kind of roll down the hill. Couldn't get them gripped into it. (laughs) And so then Lyle's like... uh, I can go back with the rest, you know, got two sleepers there and whatever. And took off and I'm sitting there in the driver's seat with my foot crammed down because every time I got weak, it would bust loose and I'm heading over. And so over the CB, because he's my mentor, I would ask questions like, when, when do you jump? When do you jump out of a truck? How do you know when to jump before you go over the edge of this road and die and, you know, be a white cross up here with the Indians? <laughs> so, I know you'll be okay, Lily. No problem. Just hang in there. And then, you know, an hour or so went by, and I needed support over the CV. I would keep calling, hey, Russ, Russ, Russ. You know what? Just the sound of another, another human's voice. And then it got time for it. Well, Lyle and I are going to bed. We're tired of listening to you. We're just going to shut the CB off. See you in the morning, really. No, no, no. And then just radio silence. And so I pulled my sleeping bag out of the sleeper and put it around me because there was snow and wind coming through the crappy Freightliner doors, as you know if you've ever run one. And I could see this little bush alongside the road that the wind was blowing. Um, And every time I got tired and and nodded my head or whatever, I'd break loose again and just scream like a girl. You know, I'm going to die. Oh, my, please, I'll never do this again. And so then when the morning finally came and I survived it, Russ, we put all my chains and all of Russ's chains on his truck, or my truck first maybe, and I made it up the hill. Had to take them all off back down to Russ's. Do you remember the highway patrolman? They came by. We were stuck there, and he he came to us and said, "I'm on my way to wreck. If you guys are still here when I get back, you're getting ticketed." Yeah. <laughs> so that gave us a little incentive to get try and get out of there. Yep. Oh. And then on that same trip, we finally 
got over by Gallusville or wherever ranch we're headed to, but uh, the deal had fallen through with Lyle because of the storm or whatever. We got different trucks because we're so late. <laughs> oh, that's what it was. Yeah, our deal had fallen through. And so Lyle, how did he leave us? Well, he flew back. He had some other cattle. He had somebody with a private plane. So he, bye boys, yeah. flew out of there. <laughs> Good luck. And so Russ and I, I don't know how, he found some little uh, pasture hall that uh, made us $100 part way. Dying cows to the <laughs> Missoula. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, somehow to get there or whatever, we went through another road closed sign and went through that little creek. There's a river thing there that filled the belly full of water, and I was bouncing. <laughs> was that my, deep? Oh yeah, my it, there was no road. That's why it was closed. Evidently, I started then to understand the road closing means you know, <laughs> come, come. We're fording the river in yeah. the summer. And so uh, my truck with the trailer it doesn't turn as sharp as Russ. Russ did a great job of weaving through all that <laughs> mine has bouncing it over boulders on the thing it's like i don't even know what damage is happening nor do i care and so we survived that one and finally made it home so that was some good mentoring <laughs> <laughs> that's what i always wondered was that you know you were just being dutiful following along <laughs> and then of course with russ uh the other part of the fun was knowing what you might haul home because Russ a lot of times would be full of corn and so whatever exotics he had then I got to haul him home mm -hmm. and I hauled the uh, emu and I remember uh no nothing of exotic animals it yeah. looks like a big turkey <laughs> to me and we had to load it from a horse trailer up into my back of the the truck and Russ and I were in there and and uh the emu started freaking out because, of course, we got to lift it off the ground, push it up in there, and it uh, kind of got loose. And I remember I reached over and grabbed it by its neck, and it was looking straight at me as it was making a few circles. <laughs> and Russ was like, let go! <laughs> let go! <laughs> and that was the emu that gave uh, oh, Russ... The, gave old Russ Colsty the claw. Yep, the claw. That uh, gave him a pretty good scratch out of there. And then I learned that they only kick forward. Was that, what does an emu do? Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. I mean, emu might have a little more ostrich only kick forward. Emus, I don't know how it got rust. They were in a big tangled up ball in the shed and when it was all over. Russ Colsey, remember you, Russ Colsey had. I think you can say that about Russ in about every situation. I'm not sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> he, he went, how, how, how did that happen to you? <laughs> Yeah. He said I was trying to dodge. It zigged. Well, I zagged and we met. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what a, he had about a 14 port. inch rip in his inside of his thigh. Had a whole bunch of stitches. And then I remember hauling buffalo. And then there's a bobcat for Leroy or something at Bozeman. I can't remember what kind of cat that yeah, we was. Had, yeah, cougars, bobcats. We even fall lions one time for him. Yeah. And then. Uh, the African lions. The camel. <laughs> the. I can't, was it Jezebel? Jezebel. Jezebel. I brought it back and came to the feedlot, and I remember Wendy and some other ladies were down at the bottom of the chute, and this, uh, I started bringing, open the gate to the camel, and I deliberately came running out, like, watch out, watch out, <laughs> and the ladies backing away, because none of us knew about the camel, just the sweetest, Should most gentle camel, you know, coming down the thing, but we all took off, because I set them up pretty good, <laughs> and then, of course, the best, uh, was it against the Christian Coalition camel story, that is another one that no one ever believes when I tell it, is when Russ somehow was going to take semen from Hank, the big camel, and then breed it into the llamas. That's right. And so Russ says, because uh, he needed some muscle, says, Willie, why don't you and Spencer was in on that one too? Yeah. Boys come in here, we're going to uh, do a little semen out of this, this big old camel. And so the camel comes down the way and another animal i don't know a lot of but he was spitting and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> big old boy hank was he was big and so they uh got him sedated just a touch and we had to flip him over and then of course with the bull 
uh, bull probe. Yeah, then light them up, you know, and try to take some samples and stuff. And there's this lady that was uh, taking the samples and looking in her microscope to see, you know, if anything was alive with it or how good the sample was. And uh, she says, uh, uh, I don't know if she asked us or something, or we ask her, uh, how's it working? And I had been laying across uh, Hank's neck when they'd light him up, juice him, you know. <laughs> and I, I remember saying, I don't know how it's working, but I just got done peeing my pants. <laughs> <laughs> I got a second. <laughs> but I, I don't know if any of those those uh llamas did they ever take you know they went overseas and, and got it to take uh from that the ruler of dubai those vets oh. on over there they got one out of him so they came here and got hold of me they bred like 30 of their llamas none of them took yeah. even, even llamas are hard to ai but they're genetically identical to camels yeah so it can happen but it's it's hard then my other uh story that i enjoyed was it became illegal to have elk here at your farm to shoot them uh, to shoot them and so russ needed to get rid of a bunch of his bull elk and uh uh gonna load them in horse trailers but to do that of course you had to tranquilize them and so uh, we'd tranquilize them elk would go down and put them on a tarp and get ready to pull them into the horse trailer but there's one bull elk that he did not do that to he's gonna keep that bull elk would come over and push you off of the elk you're working and give him one last breed. Like, you're going to wake up from this sometime. You will remember me. You will remember me. Like, what kind of weird oh natural God. cycle is right. that? <laughs> yeah, lots of fun. Oh, man. It's, yeah. It was so funny with those elk. <clears throat> those big bulls would lose their horns first in the winter and the spikes would lose them last and those big bulls just dominate those poor little spikes then a few days after the big bulls drop their horns those little spikes are working them over like they'd be eating together and those little spikes would come up to the good corn and poke them off of there poke them right <laughs> off <laughs> a lot braver than i would have been uh, yeah. <clears throat> and then of course uh lyle used to auction at the great falls auction they had two auctions in in uh, great falls western and great falls live i think it was <laughs> and so one night russ and i were together and uh it was around christmas time like it is now and russ i always had this radio show you would listen to out of denver koa yeah yeah and so <laughs> of course no cell phones so a payphone at that auction and Russ and I crammed into this payphone <laughs> Russ calls into the show and, and gets picked up and uh, talking to her a little bit and I remember he uh, she asked whatever he does and, and of course he wasn't going to fess up he was hauling hogs he was an auctioneer <laughs> that night oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so he gave a little auction chant and then uh, I don't know how it happened but Russ and I ended up singing a Christmas carol over the phone to that lady I, and that was part of our entertainment on koa did. denver yeah there i still go. remember that lady it was kathy bradshaw some of you old time truckers probably remember her huh. at night show and russ uh, we one of the memories i had was when in jackson you can't tell me you haven't done this several times <laughs> trucking with your dad Every time you stop the truck, you're wasting, you know, 10, 15 minutes to to relieve yourself or whatever. And, right. and so Russ had this yellow flashlight, just the case of it. Because they used to have them big batteries inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'd pull the battery out. And he'd put his seeds in there. And then he was in the sleeper, and he says, Willie, hand me that yellow flashlight, would you, for a second? And so I handed him the flashlight. <laughs> yeah, I, don't know. I was like, well, you got more seeds. And he's... Next thing I know, it comes back like a frothy beer <laughs> over the front there. And he goes, Willie, check that out the side. And I learned the technique of throwing. Because you can't just throw the flashlight. The flashlight's supposed to come back. And so you roll the windows down. And you don't just throw it out like this. Or no. the splashback oh. is like, oh, wow. That's salty. But anyway, so you cup it so it's like this. 
So when you throw the action, you have a nice pattern that goes way up. Yeah, Yeah. the arc. And so after years of saving time, I told Russ, I said, uh, you know, what a guy should do is we got some old stainless steel milkers that the Uncle's Dairy, and I go, wouldn't it be nice if you just had one of those that had a little hose that run down your gear shift? and out the bottom of this truck yeah and so russ says that's not a bad idea really (laughs) and so i went and got one and spencer's designed it and welded it together with the hose and it even had a little holder right by the gear shift. <laughs> yeah i remember the holster <laughs> and i think we called it the trucker's friend <laughs> but the fun part of that was uh out at our shop russ had his truck worked on there once in a while and our mechanic blair was underneath the truck working on it and here's this tube and he's, he's looking at it and he goes what's that tube and Spencer said something like, well, you might want to blow it and make sure it's open. And so <laughs> no. Then he pulled him back. He said, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> he was like, that's the trucker's friend. And Blair's like, the trucker's friend. <laughs> and so he pulled up and saw what that cup was. And I mean, it was a very custom, it was a beautiful work of art. Stainless steel. Yes. Oh. And so then after that, Blair was just nervous as heck working underneath the Russ's truck. But Russ did mention to me that when the motorbike uh, rally at Sturgis, that sometimes he just unhooked the hose and wear that trucker's friend with a bungee cord around town because <laughs> it was so. <laughs> That's totally Sturgis, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude. Oh. You know about that old yellow flashlight empty case? The reason you'd fill that partially with seeds before you'd use it as a whisk cup is because it takes all the splash factor out. Oh, yeah. There's no splash <laughs> at all with all those seeds all floating on top. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, this is the kind of this is the kind of old wisdom, trucker wisdom. Yeah, this is old you school. Don't, you don't learn this in trucking school. <laughs> and then the other things that I enjoyed was uh, somehow Russ had this bulk candy in big boxes that he would get out of south dakota that he'd bring back to the feedlot yeah, what was that deal <clears throat> well the, the deal was you know we call a lot of goose eggs from the colonies There's a couple places in south dakota that would take these goose eggs and blow them out and use them for decorations and christmas ornaments and this old guy that did this he also had a, some some kind of connection to these candy factories so we get these whole cases of salted Nut rolls that were just run back and forth instead of putting in the... <laughs> instead of cutting them up? And then we'd have boxes of those little uh, cinnamon bears and those other little gummy things. Like literal cases. cases. Oh, yeah. Like 30-pound oh, yeah. cases. 30-pound, yeah. 30-pound yeah. boxes. Yeah. But he had a special way because, of course, at the feedlot, how are you going to give that out? You know, just pull. Right. So he would grab a preg check glove. And they filled that with candy. And I think most of them weren't used <laughs> at this time. Because <laughs> you just feel that. So you'd have this prank check glove of candy that you'd be eating out of it to feed <laughs> Remember those Hutterite ladies that come in there? Can we get some of that? Oh, yeah. And those you know sleeves go clear yeah. here so they get them filled up this. They and take a lot of candy out of there. One of Russ's unique backhauls was an unbelievable amount of socks. That went to one of the colonies. Tube socks. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. And so when we they met us on our way home, and all these other ladies were going through the socks and trying them on, you know, and stuff like that. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and these were not paying back hauls. These were all favors. But I remember one time I had uh, cases of brassiers. They were nursing bras. <laughs> And I didn't know what that was in for sure, but I had him here at the house, and a bunch of Hutterite ladies came in to get him. And I said, "What are what are in those cases?" And they goes, a "Milk containers." <laughs> <laughs> milk containers. <laughs> she told me. And I go, "Really?" And then she said, "No, they're nursing bras." And oh man, did they break up laughing? <laughs> <after>. <laughs> and then when you talk about bad weather. Uh, Russ would usually try to run with the storm ahead of it to get to South Dakota, and then we'd catch it coming back. And the one time uh, Russ and I were together, I had a a friend, uh, Merle Sheldon, wanted to come with me trucking. He worked at the tire store here, 
and so that was the trip i told me yeah come out i'm following rest to sioux falls it'll be fun and so we got there and came back to to kadoka horrible weather which any trucker knows south dakota can bring it because there's nothing to slow it down (laughs) and uh pulled into kadoka and and uh cold cold so we all slept oh you abandoned my truck because with if it's not moving it doesn't put heat out i don't know why that old cab over freight liner cold cold blooded and uh so we all slept upstairs in russ's truck in that uh, fancy little sleeper that he had built on not a lot of heat there either and so we would wedge merrill between russ and i and kind of, you know, like hogs do, you know, we kind of throw a leg over there. And it was like, shh, shh, shh. Just, And that's where the, the first saying of don't ask, don't tell. Because we got real friends. It's like, you got good body. <laughs> Merle, you're really putting it off. Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we were there like three days. They ran out of food in that cafe. Each day it was a meag- more meager, meager options. And the last day, I don't know. It was really scraping the barrel. We and got each night, a Merle, cross outs. <laughs> Merle started putting out a little less heat every night. <laughs> and needless to say, he never, ever trucked again. In fact, he became a mortician after that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Come with us. It'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. But on a more serious note, <clears throat> my truck was a unique setup. Not a lot of people were comfortable driving, especially backing it up. And on one trip, I had a retina detached. And I had to have emergency surgery out in Sioux Falls or Omaha or somewhere. I was stuck in Sioux Falls. I was supposed to lay on my stomach for like six days for that nitrogen bubble they injected in my eye to push against the retina until it kind of healed. And so I'm sitting out there with no way I could, they'd let me drive home. And so Willie dropped everything he was doing, jumped in the old van, it's Aerostar. The old wind. Ford Aerostar. And came busting out because he was the only person in the world I would trust driving <laughs> that truck because it was a highly specialized piece of equipment. So he came out and took my truck home for me, and Wendy stayed out there to nurse me in that motel for five or six days. Yeah. But I always appreciate that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was good. Like I remember I did a trip after that for Russ, and then when well, Russ— Well, you hauled a load of hogs with it. <clears throat> after yeah. and and i knew how to do the corn because i'd been to mitchell several times you know how he had it all set up uh and at the end of that i i remember russ said uh willie I, i'd like to pay you for you know running my truck here and i told russ i said i don't think you could pay me for running that truck because <laughs> it's such a bad i mean only russ knew every trick to that truck and i mean you it gave me a lot of respect for just how tough old rest buddy was because it's like he does this every week in the old yeah you know for years i brought back hay and willie even got in yep. a couple of hay hauls we stuffed those old trailers to the brim with little with square side. bales yeah yeah no it was <laughs> it was good and then of course later i i set up my guthrie if you've ever heard of a guthrie trailer mm. That's what I, I had a 48 foot 102 Guthrie and uh, set that up so that I could haul corn back to if Russ had two loads. And, a whole homemade yeah. setup just like mine was. Yeah, and so that was that was good. But Bill filled his nose with corn. He just hanged those little tiny skinny. I remember blue that tarps. actually. Yeah. And they'd poke out the holes about two inches, and you could see every corn kernel. You see the kernel? <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> just the camping turf. I can't believe it would hold that. I'd just be yeah. amazed. Yeah. I don't think you ever spilled one, did you? I don't think I had a problem with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I remember you boys doing soybeans up at Shoto quite regularly. Yeah. Yeah, we, t- we talked about that on one of the first, first episodes. Did you ever unload those the soybeans or the corn out of dad's truck yeah we talked about this could not unload those without hitting a knuckle on the ceiling so the middle knuckle on a finger always one of them had just scabs on it yeah couldn't unload couldn't unload that stuff without smashing hands on the ceiling you know i because of course 
Russ being almost like an older brother to me and my mentor and and how to uh, make the trucking industry pay out for me. I I also watched how he handled his kids and stuff and and I always enjoyed where you're talking about hustle, you know, and, and running to do it. I remember Luke when, of course, the oldest son, how I would always have to go around to open the gates. I'd follow the alley, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. and go get it. it. Luke would just jump over the fences <laughs> like a rabbit <laughs> to get the thing and bring him around. And then, of course, at the feedlot, if you were lucky if a gate swung naturally, it always dragged against something froze or <laughs> right. to the ground, so you'd hold it up. <laughs> and so when the hogs would be coming down the thing, you didn't want to miss a hog because Russ would not be pleased with your action. <laughs> and you guys weren't even as heavy as the gate. But I was always impressed, like, boy, those guys can cut hogs. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> Stoney, one night at Stone's in lewistown there was this big old mean boar back in the dark barn and uh i remember uh, bringing it up and it gave one of those whoop, you know like they do <laughs> yeah. and it, it kind of got me to and stoney had a little fear and he's just a little whiff of a kid and i remember russ taking one hand setting him up on top of the railroad town he said you just stay and i don't you know no crying or whatever and i kind of you know okay so i was sure if he's talking to stoney or me because i didn't know the hogs quite as well and i can't remember if that was the hog that they loaded with the bobcat because there was one of them that was such a nasty bugger so mean that they took the bobcat bucket and brought him to the chute and held it there so he had to go up the thing. <laughs> I mean, there there were some interesting hogs. Some nasty dudes. And I also had stones, which I can confess now because limitations is over. And to just go back for you guys real quick, stones was the place Rooster told us a story a while back about having a, a battle with a sow and a board in the borrow pit in the snow. This is Stone's Corral. This is all the same place. He'd, he'd buy sows and boars for me, so I'd yeah. pull in there and pick them up. So there's a lot of – usually there's always something at Stone's. It was like, oh, so, boy. At Stone's, a very nice facility, and th- you could tell he worked at keeping it up and things all functional. And and uh, I went there one night, and I, I needed to go in his office for something, and I grabbed the doorknob, and the whole doorknob thing just fell <laughs> apart. I mean, I was like, oh, my heavens. And so I left him a note, and I said, so sorry about your doorknob. If there's anything I can do to help fix it, please let me know Paul Hofer. (laughs) 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 Russ knows Paul was the king of the cattle trekkers for years. (laughs) I left that little note (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man. And, of course, with Stoney, the son, the... Out at Sioux Falls, Russ had to load sideways or unload sideways, and so see, there's uh, only one chute I could get into <clears throat> sideways. So when we would unload the hogs, about a mile trek through all these alleys and to get down to where they needed to be pinned. And so we'd unload. Russ would take off with a group, and then he says, "Just in a few minutes, bring the next group." And so I'd bring the next group of hogs. We needed to keep them separate or whatever. And coming down this half a mile, mile run to get to where they need to be, here comes Stoney walking up. And in those days, Stoney had one uh, lazy eye, and he was wearing (laughs) bib overalls with no shirt, and he had no shoes on. And the consistency of the pigment or the the poop would just come right between his toes and stuff. I'm bringing my hogs down, I meet Stoney, I go, Stoney, buddy, what, what you doing, man? He goes, I don't know, I'm heading back up. So I grabbed him and threw him up on my shoulder, and I finally got up to Russ, and I go, Russ, Stoney ain't got no shoes on. What? Are you, what? She said, and Russ goes, shh, he says, don't tell Wendy, but it's easier to clean his feet than the tennis shoes he's wearing. <laughs> <laughs> and then one other time, a stone that stuck in my mind. And he's he about a three-year-old. So <laughs> yeah. Stoney is our youngest brother, yeah. youngest kid in the family. He uh, wasn't big enough to wander the alleyways, and Russ and I uh, couldn't babysit him. Because there's a lot going on when you're unloading, yeah, there's a lot going. And so Russ set him up on top of a dumpster, 
and he stayed there while we unloaded the truck and then Russ goes uh, Willie go back and grab Stoney and so I went over there and as I was getting close to the dumpster and this was not winter this was in the heat of summer a wave of stench that you could almost <laughs> not walk through and I was like holy moly Stoney I'm coming <laughs> I come over to the thing, grab Tony, and I had to see what could put off a smell like that. So I opened up the side of the thing and flies and stuff, and there's a bunch of old U's <laughs> that someone had checked in that thing. It's Tony for hours, and we had to have him out. He's waiting for us to finish. <laughs> I was like, yo, oh, I'm going to raise my kids just as tough. <laughs> yeah. And we wonder why Weston ended up being a lawyer and kind of stepping out. <laughs> you know, at Sioux Falls, I was in there uh, close to 2,000 trips into that place. And it, one time they had little pamphlets on all the, to, with information about the yards and a picture, an overhead picture, and I was looking at it. There was a picture of Old Blue. Whenever they took that drone All picture. Oh, the aerial shot. Oh, really? Yeah, there's Old Blue parked there. Sitting there. That's very fitting because yeah. Old Blue is part of the part of the scenery there. Well, Billy, you remember that time that that uh, Russell rode out with you? Oh, yeah. And, and you know, I, I was so well-known at Sioux Falls that I take a lot of liberties that most people couldn't. So underneath the help of the yards, there was a, a shower and some lockers and some old towels. So I'd always go shower there to save some money, and it's a pretty nice shower. And one time Russell was with us, and and the towels. Were, so Russell is Bill's younger brother. Yeah, Bill's younger brother. And these old towels, they hang them on a hook, and uh, one of them, the rust on it, I've seen it before, looked exactly like they'd use it for toilet paper. <laughs> it was a perfect, perfect color. It didn't look like rust. It actually looked like a soiled towel. So I told Bill, <laughs> so after Russ gets out of the shower, I'll we'll just have this towel available for him, and, and then if he starts using it, he'd say, oh, Russ, <laughs> there was no toilet paper in the bathroom there. <laughs> Sorry, he so, had to use that towel, and he'd just been uh, swistling and clean himself with that yeah. towel. We both stopped and was like, oh, oh no, Russ. <laughs> no, Russ, and Russ was like, what? <laughs> just pulling that off his face, basically. He was not pleased. <laughs> Oh, that was a, that was a, a fun trip. Oh, oh. Yeah, those are good days. I I paid a lot of bills on the farm trucking cows. It helped helped out quite a bit. Look at all the stories you got for free. And you know, the, when you talk about generational mentorship, the I have always uh, thoroughly enjoyed the Allen family and. And even from the day uh, Don Allen was kind of a hero to me when I was a little kid. And I remember my folks uh, left me by accident, I presume, <laughs> at church a couple, three times. And Don would take me home and and uh, feed me until my folks figured out, you know, they're missing me. And, and uh, give me some feedlot pens and pencils and little pamphlets <laughs> and stuff. And, and then he'd help me with uh, my little cattle project because I always like livestock. And then, of course, when uh, I got to know Russ better and, and he made a living buying and selling and, and following Russ, I, I've, I, it's probably one of the most exciting stories you know on the farm you have some great stories but not the adventure if you're looking for adventure and i've hauled a little flatbed used to do reefer quite a bit used to go to portland all the time come back for butcheries and then the livestock part of it it was the best but you have to be a little bit tough uh, and you also have to know cattle because you can't just be a trucker and truck cows you right. have to be the cowboy and the trucker to be successful at it that you really need mentorship in, in handling cattle but i think one of the my most vivid memories that wasn't the funnest when i had a, a differential go out on my truck on i-90 and i heard a big bang and at the exact moment i was going by a rest area and i just reflexively got in there I was able to pull right up alongside the rest area before everything 
was busted up. So it was a bit of an unbelievable cold storm. So I called Bill and his brother Spencer to see if Spencer would be interested in, in the job to come out and change this differential. Just a 700-mile service call? <laughs> yeah. No big deal <laughs> in the wintertime? But one of the main uh, selling points was Deadwood. <laughs> 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 so Spencer got the rear end and got toolbox and generators and hoses and everything. And when they got out to me out there, it was it had to be 20 below oh yeah wind without the wind chill and the wind was just howling so we set some canvas underneath the truck to try and get it out of the wind a little bit and we had space heaters going and then we uh, had long cords we had the generator up next to the rest area and it was outside real cold we plugged it in on the men's side everything went black whole rest area on the men's <laughs> side yep. we blew something and so our only choice now was the women's side, but we were afraid we had to have some juice, so we actually put the generator inside the women's restroom and let it warm up a little bit. And when we plugged it in, luckily it started producing air, and and we were able to, <laughs> to have air to, <laughs> to run to your tools. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, oh, it was so... But I've never seen the cold like that. The part that I remembered, though, is I think it... Uh, I can't remember which uh, part of the, uh, what part we were working on inside the ladies' room, because uh, that's the only place that had electricity, and someone actually showed up maybe <laughs> to use it or whatever. There's you know, an air compressor in there and a bunch yeah, of dudes. Like, excuse me, ma'am. <laughs> Russ said something. Excuse me. Would, this is closed. This is what we're finding in here. Or something. <laughs> She's like, <"Hand> down the <laughs> room. Yeah. Oh, man. And, of course, with my brother Spencer, I remember when we did get to Deadwood, uh, Russ and I were taking a little urination out in front of the pickup that Spencer was riding. And it was at, in the evening at night, and there was really no one around looking. There was, you know, houses or buildings. But Spencer backs up and honks the horn and flashing the lights as Russ and I are out there. And, and I did get even with him years later. So now you never trust a brother because he will move the pickup and honk and make all kinds of noise to bring attention. And that was the Deadwood. I did learn to count to 21 fairly well. <laughs> Over the years. Yep. Man, Bill, I got to tell you, my favorite, my favorite thing about trucking with you when uh, don't mind the lights it's her anyway um my favorite thing about trucking with you was one it was a shiny long nose freight liner loved that flat top with the big arrow wing the chrome wing back then it was so cool and uh and you had this way that you would you kind of would you always shifted kind of like this kind of tap your shifter do you remember that <laughs> yeah, kind yeah. of i don't know if that was a purposeful thing but always watching you shift where you know, Dad's shift pattern on that cab over was like that big, so you're like, boop, 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 and you were just like, <laughs> and so I just loved that. But um, I kind of had a thing for always. I was always trying to clean Dad's truck. I was always, you know, trying to get in to buy a, buy a chrome lug nut cover. And if you just buy one a week, <laughs> by the end of the year, you'll have the whole truck. Um, no, 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 that's a waste of money. So I would at least, the trips I'd come, I loved to clean, you know. So he'd buy a couple things, armor all, and a bunch of shop towels. And I'd spend the whole trip just shining. So then when I'd get finished there, he would send me on back to Bill's truck. And uh, so same thing, I'd start going. And and uh, I noticed over every time that I'd do this, I'd start finding coins. You know, I'm cleaning the floor and putting, you know, pop cans in the garbage. And I think we had those little dying 12-volt vacuums that back yeah. at the time seemed pretty sweet but nowadays you'd kind of laugh at and and so i'm vacuuming and just would find lots of coin like quarters and dimes and nickels and pennies and do you know at first like oh cool to get to a point where i'd like come back up between the seats and present like this pot of coins to bill and i'm like hey i found all this money back there just kind of in the nooks and crannies and Bill would always let me keep it. He goes, you just, you just keep that. I don't know what's there, but just keep it. And I remember, you know, counting it one time. It was like twelve dollars <laughs> in coins, and I was just like, you know, it. Eight years old was just like, 
this is awesome. <laughs> and so I think the coinage would come from when you'd go back, because when you're livestock yeah. trucking, it's just naps. You never get to sleep. And so half the time now, and I understand now, you'd crawl back there and you kind of unbutton your pants and fall on the thing. Yeah. And in those days, that was when you had cash and coins all the time. So all the coins would fall out of Bill's pockets every time from each day. So I had just days and days of pocket change that I would round up. And a couple times a summer, he'd give me the, here you go. There you go. Good work. That's your pay. <laughs> <laughs> so the pants falling down reminds me of another great story of Russ, buddy. It was illegal to haul corn without authority for a while out of South Dakota. I don't know what was going on there. Do you remember all that, Russ? Yeah, you couldn't haul for <coughs> someone else, so I was saying it's my own corn. Yeah. And then they tried to say it has to be processed. I said, ah, I don't think so. Oh, and so for you guys wondering out there in the trucking world, you don't need an MC number to haul cattle. You just need a DOT number. You don't have to have authority as the as the government knows it. You just you can just haul with the DOT number. So it fits farmers really well and ranchers not to truck on the side. But Rooster with this backhaul was bringing grain back, and apparently that fell a little out say, into a gray area. And so there's this guy at the Mitchell scale that really had it out for rest for years yeah just it, it all started once <clears throat> pulled me in and and was I had some uh, in the typical cold cold winter I had a bunch of light calves in the belly of my pup so I put a bunch of big sows with them they were loose but pigs put off so much heat and I thought it'd be a better chance of keeping those light calves alive so I pulled into Mitchell and he's out so that's illegal you're getting a ticket can't mix species for mixing your last <laughs> yeah so he's in there and i said i don't believe you so he's in there looking through his book going through and couldn't find anything and finally the other guy there said you either have to show him or let him go <laughs> and so ever since then he's been after me but i did find there actually is a rule but it's for interstate so oh, yeah. if i was a south dakota and i couldn't do that but interstate they have no huh. no authority to hmm. regulate how you haul stuff and so Russ had loaded with corn on his back call, and here comes a highway patrol, and he looks at me, and he just flies past me and pulls between me and Russ. And so Russ pulls over, and here comes a GVW guy out and starts giving Russ a hard time or whatever. We decided we'd take this to the truck stop because, of course, phones, you know, aren't in your truck. Mm -hmm. And so we go to the truck stop, and... and uh, I'm watching this from uh, the side, you know. I'm not quite in the middle of it yet. Russ's door on the driver's side would not open. Of course, it would malfunction at that moment. <laughs> the first and only time in the history yeah. that truck would the open. The old freight line. And, of course, to be comfortable, a lot of us bigger boys, we kind of like to undo the pants a little when we're driving. Yeah. And so Russ's pants were down... And he had to clean off all the multitude of stuff that was on the doghouse and then slide over to the passenger side. And it was difficult for him to get flipped around so his feet coming down. So he kind of did a flip to find that. The back of his pants got snagged on the window roller, which exposed, you know, himself. <laughs> and so here's Russ trying to be as dignified as possible, ready to take on the GVW, and it just looks like some circus act coming out of this truck. We go inside the truck stop. The highway patrol is looking at me, and now we're uh, face to face, you know, standing, and Russ is calling the GVW guy's boss, and the GVW guy is looking at Russ, you know, like, <laughs> I got you now. <laughs> and uh, and so I've been talking to his boss, saying I don't need this stuff, and he finally agreed with me. So I said, you call Pierre. And he called, and the guy was out. He was <laughs> out in the country somewhere. And uh, anyway, so I'm, he couldn't do anything. I said, yeah, you're going to be in big trouble because I'm clear. And Bill's in the background humming one of those for a few dollars more tunes. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I couldn't resist it because we're all just ready for anybody flinch. It's going to be nothing but lead. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was so good. All over corn. I was like, this is corn. corn. We're, we're fighting what, what over we? corn. And see this, this, this deal. De de this GVW guy, he had hijacked a highway patrolman to run me down. 
Because yep. he he's not supposed to be in one of those cars. Couldn't believe when he stepped out of that highway patrol car. Yeah, it, <laughs> and that battle lasted for years. Yeah. He never got me for nothing. Yeah. I'd just rip him every time. It, it turned out. <laughs> and then the other... Uh, yeah. One time he spent a lot of time in the hospital. One trucker beat him up so bad. Ooh. He was off work for like six months. <laughs> and then a few years after that, old Bob told me that he's in prison for abusing his stepdaughter. Oh, oh boy. Jesus. Yeah. And then I, uh, one other that I remember that I thought, because you have to learn what to say and what not to say when you go through the scale. And, of course, me being a newbie, it's like, oh, here's my family history. <laughs> yeah, you know, all just way just too much vomit. information. Yes, yeah. way ah, too yeah. much. <laughs> Less is more. It's better. And so, uh, and of course, I'd always try to figure out how Russ, you know, handled himself in the scales. And this one time, this, I called her Beef Jerky was her name because she's weathered. Smoked a pack of Marlboros, just an old nag. And she was ornery as can be. And she tells Russ, she says, uh, there is a hog uh, that you lost on the highway back there or whatever. And Russ looks at her and he goes, what hog? Ain't my hog. <laughs> and of course, she Bill's just like- naturally <laughs> thought, because Russ is a hog hauler, and I do believe later Russ said, well, I might have got out of this one. <laughs> one, one little spot in my trailer. Yeah, yeah. It, it had to be mine, but there's no way to prove it. I said, did someone see it fall out? Or <laughs> Yeah, and it, it just bewildered her and made her so aggravated because <laughs> verbally she could just not get him painted in the corner. And it's like, oh, I will keep that. I will not say stupid things Remember that incriminate that. me. Mm-hmm. And she finally said, I have to at least give you some kind of a warning. I go, why? I didn't do nothing. It's not my hog. <laughs> she just. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, man. Speaking of South, that Rapid City area, I remember one trip where this was when uh, Holton and Kendra were old enough that they were coming along. I think it was me and Lee and Kenzie, probably Stoney, and Holton and Kendra. So there's six of us kids between you and dad. And. Uh, of course, in these later years, Old Blue was pretty haggard, pretty rattled out, two million miles on this old spring ride truck and still just soldiering on every week, <laughs> yeah. you know. And uh, there was a DOT jump scale that had set up. I don't even remember this. There's a DOT jump scale set up just east of Rapid City. And we were hustling because we wanted to go see a movie. You know, that was the whole promise yeah. of the trip. It was like, we're going to take all you kids. The Spearfish had a theater we yep. could get to as well. And... Uh, they said, and and Bill, you guys got to understand. Bill got to a point where, like, he took some serious pride in your ride with Old Black. Like, it was just, it was beautiful. It smelled good inside. I mean, it was armor all top to bottom, shiny everything on the outside. I mean, you really, that was like you really had stepped in and were, you know. I, I love that trick. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, he really did. So we pull in, they pull both cattle trucks in, you know, and pull Dad in, who's loaded with corn. I don't think in this one you had a backhoe. I think it was just Dad. So the belly of that pup trailer's, you know, bowed down to the highway, and the wheels are kind of cocked to the side, and the tarps are squishing out the side, and and uh, and we're got the whole truckload full of kids, I believe, and uh, and they just wave old rooster right on through. Just miracle of miracles. Well, he didn't actually weigh me through. He said, what, "He said, well, how's your weight? I said, what are you hauling? I said, corn, but my weight's okay. <laughs> like a Star Wars yeah, Jedi. Like when they used my the force. weights are okay. <laughs> my weights are fine. <laughs> I am fine. You will let me go. But that guy behind me that just washed his truck and his <laughs> truck <trying, laughs> looks like what every truck should be looking like. He probably has a problem. <laughs> so sure enough. We get to Spearfish and there's no Bill. We're like, huh, I wonder what happened to Bill. We wait and wait and wait and Bill finally rolls in. That guy gave me the full inspection yeah. and I got oh all my. the while rooster in the old camel. Yeah. <laughs> go on your way. Yeah. Oh, I, no words. <laughs> you know, so all truckers kind of go through stages where they take a little bit of pride in their truck. I think I'm one of the few that never actually <laughs> fell for that. But I did wash my truck twice a year at the Blue Beacon in Sioux Falls. (laughs) (laughs) Whether it needed it or not. (laughs) There you go. Oh, Oh, man. We're out of time. We'll have to do this again. 
you, you'll sit here and go through this and you'll start remembering other stuff that's what that's what we found oh yeah so when you're in town again we'll have to do it again man it's been fun enjoyed it <laughs> it's always good to see old rooster again mm-hmm. brings back collect some memories oh. yep. yeah yeah we got some good farming stories from the old days of working on the farm too we got to go through at some point some good i would think jackson would try to repress a lot of those <laughs> stories <laughs> You know, it, it was, you got kind of tough, and then that was about when you started dating Terry, and then you kind of rekindled the, oh, the yeah. romanticism, and it was always new surprises every day. <laughs> <laughs> the Willie rekindling the fire. Best thing I ever did. <laughs> you guys should do an episode once on Colostrum, too. Yeah, on old Russ. Yeah. yeah. Well, all right. Uh, stay at the wheel podcast at gmail.com. If you need to reach out, stay at the wheel podcast podcast on instagram on my uh you can check out the youtube channel at wild wild west and uh, on instagram look up shamanush all right thanks guys